Hey guys, I am so excited to announce that the movie that you've been waiting for, the documentary Dr. Patient, is now available for rent or purchase at drpatientmovie.com. Check out the trailer here. When I really knew something was wrong was when I started having trouble walking up the stairs. I was supposed to be grateful and happy and healing and well and thriving, but I did not feel that way. I was so sick. Like always, I wanted to find an answer and I had to figure it out, and I had to figure it out to save my own life. So I dove in. Jill is the leading voice in biotoxin illness and chronic conditions that are driven by toxicity. Oh my gosh, you're dealing with mold? You have to work with Dr. Jill Carnahan. Dr. Jill was the first person that actually began to shed some light on the problem. What I do is listen to the patient and we together talk about what else is possible. I don't know why I'm crying. <laughs> she saved my life. The deepest lessons and most profound insights come in the suffering, come in the dark moments. Self-compassion is the healing transition that, that shifts something inside of us. It's actually the thing that we need most in order to heal. Dr. Patient. Available now at DrPatientMovie.com. Welcome to Resiliency Radio, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in integrative and functional medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Jill, and with each episode, we bring you to the heart of healing and personal transformation with cutting-edge renowned experts, thought leaders, and innovators who are at the forefront of medical research and practice empowering you with knowledge and inspiration and aiding you on your journey to optimal health. Hey guys, you've heard me talk about it, but it's out now, my patient uh, movie that is called Dr. Patient. It's at drpatientmovie.com. If you've read my book or heard my story or just been interested in the lives of those with chronic complex illness, you can now watch it, stream it, rent it, or gift it at drpatientmovie.com. So check it out. Let me know what you think. Today, I am so excited to introduce my guest, Dr. Corbin Pop, he's been providing world-class Swiss biological dentistry to the Denver community for over 10 years. In conjunction with his advanced clinical expertise, he exudes passion for helping his patients achieve systemic vitality. We both share that. And I'm so excited to dive in today. His supportive demeanor and positive energy elevates the patient experience, providing a comforting and transformative process. Prior to his, his dental career, he was a professional ballet and Broadway dancer and continues to embody the act of excellence in performance with his dental team. Welcome, Dr. Pop. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Yes, it is great to have you. We were just commiserating about the ski season. We were trying to get away to ski, and this year I broke my wrist, and so it'll have to be next year, but we soon will hopefully actually get um, outside and enjoy some of that as well. Um, I have always admired those of you in the dental field because I know that what I do is, isn't possible at all without someone like you because we know our topic today is how the mouth, the dentition, and all that you do is connected to whole body health. So we're going to dive into that. But before we do, I always like to hear our guest stories a little bit about how did you get into dentistry and then especially biological dentistry? Yeah. Okay. Um, I get, uh, that's a good, that's a good one. Okay. So I'll give you the, the, the cliff notes. Um, I was pre-med. I was, a. I grew up in Nebraska. My dad was actually a dentist in a small town. So that might be the, the quickest uh, way to the end. Uh, dad always said, um, dentistry is so great, you know, medicine might be tied so much with insurance and things like that. And, uh, and so he was always, he put that, that little seed in my brain, but I, I really wasn't interested in, in dentistry. I was interested in chemistry and I was, or an organic chemist mostly and studied really hard with that, but I was pre-med and, um, and then I started to travel and I went to Australia and I, I started just to see more things and I was starting to get passion elsewhere. I was so tired of physics and math and science because yeah. that's where I lived. Um, and then I was, I was really looking to go to medical school. I decided to ap apply for a Fulbright um, to do some of the chemistry, but believe it or not, I needed one credit to graduate to get the Fulbright. And so... I did a lot of things as a kid. I danced as well. Um, my sister was a dancer and I was like, as a young kid at 12, 
and in and, and some, some, even some competitions partnering. I really liked partnering, but I didn't dance at all because in Nebraska, you, you know, you play football and you, you need to do that, which I'm really glad I, I got the opportunity to do those sports. But here I am, a senior in college, applying for a Fulbright in Germany. Uh, I postponed going to medical school because I'm like, the Fulbright's really, this is great. It's a lot of passion for it. So I took this one credit, a dance class. That was it. It was done. I didn't want to do anything else but dance. And basically that's what happened is uh, I started a, a 10 year uh, professional dance career. Being a guy that can partner, I could do that luckily, but it led me to places like the Sacramento ballet where I, I met my wife and then I moved to New York at right place, right time. I landed a, a Billy Joel musical and danced that for five years. Uh, so I had this really like a, a right place, right time thing going on. And I had so much passion for, for dance and movement. And I felt so sedentary before that in my senior year in college, just, just sitting there doing chemistry and math and physics. Um, so, so that happened. Um, my wife and I were dancing on a cruise line uh, doing Twyla Tharp dance, which some, some people, the dancers might know that. And uh, we came back from this cruise line pregnant with twins. Oh, wow. So that grounded us. And I was like, oh, well, I don't really want to go back to New York, not with kids. So I was like, OK, well, dad always said, you know, dentistry is great. Well, I used to wax crowns at the ballet in Sacramento. So I'm like a dentistry. Yeah, this this is no problem. I could do this. And I went back, luckily got into a place down in Arizona um, and and started to get into dentistry again, which is awesome. Um, and I was happy to do that because I felt like I had a bit of control as well. I was always worried about um what what medicine looks like for most doctors now, which is so volumetric and insurance based. And I'm so glad, you know, I know you don't do that. You don't practice that way. And neither do I, but dentistry can be that way too. I just felt it gave me a little bit more of an option. Um, biological dentistry, you know, I did my residency in Colorado, surgical. I was interested in surgery um, at CU. And then you know, I've a mountain Nebraska kid in the mountains. I, I, I was like, okay, I'm going to go to the mountains. And I, and I started to practice in gypsum. Well, it didn't take very long for me to realize I'd never pay off my student loans. And so I was driving down to Denver and Alamosa to work. And I started to work at a biological dental office in Denver. And, and I, my eyes were just blown open because I went from a place of dentistry, which was public health mostly, that's in dental school. You, you you do rotations of public health. And so you see people that I would say are generally not taking great care of themselves. Diet, I'd yeah. say number one. So I go to this biological dental office for one, their fee for service. So they wanted good service and yeah. they would pay for it. It wasn't like a discount insurance plan. Uh, so I, I got that right away. And I thought that was so awesome. But what I noticed is these patients... They, they didn't have the same issues that uh, the normal population, or I'd say the, the general population had, because they, I, I make a joke about it, but they walked in gluten-free. Yes. Many of them were, and they didn't have the gum issues. Yeah. They, it was so rare they had periodontal disease. Now, these were patients that often were seeking um, a greater health journey because they were chronically ill. Yes. Maybe. And, you know, this is when we started to see, you know, Lyme come on. And, and now, now you're like, well, mold is right there with yeah. it. Um, and then mast cell, the things that you speak so much about, we're seeing it in the biological dental world. And, and I think we have to be a little bit more um, pr practicing kind of one-on-one -on -one dentistry and giving time because as, as you know, in your, many yeah. of your podcasts, uh, it's the, the patients, they have to be heard which means they need time, which is so unusual for uh, a medical, I, I, for sure, but dental as well. It's a volumetric type uh, practice is what we're taught. Um, so that's in a nutshell, how I, I got into biological dentistry, right place at the right time for most of the things in my life I'm so thankful for. Um, but I, I always, I feel like I do always strive to try to get to the next place. And I think it takes somebody like that to be able to treat patients that we're seeing today, which are, as you know, and we'll talk about, they take a much more dynamic uh, solution. It's not static, you know, it's 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 not simple. Uh, it's lovely when they are, but yeah. they're not always. Um, and they're becoming more complicated. 
Yeah. Uh, so I think the, the, the role of the biological dentist, which is, is really just, I, I always just say it's, it's a comprehensive view. That's yeah. really what it is. That's why, like I said, we work so well together. And I'm so, first of all, I love your story because what I see is some of the characteristics that I see in the most smart, influential kinds of people that are changing the landscape of dentistry and medicine and that, and that's that artistic, creative curiosity that led you to dance, like that whole yeah. quality that, that led you to, you know, all I, amazing. I had no idea of your background, but all those qualities are part of what makes you a phenomenal dentist because you're curious, you're creative, you're thinking of solutions. And honestly, for both you and I and anyone in our fields, we have to be incredibly creative and curious because there is nothing simple about what we do. I find all the time, like some of my best treatment plans and uh, ability to diagnose is actually almost from an inspirational intuitive view because you take all that data, but that's a very creative place that is not yeah. taught in dental school and medicine. And I see how that could come together with your with your yeah. dance career. I, and I love that. It, it just makes me um, admire you all the more. So, um, so then you got into biological dentist and like you said, the key there, and this is many of our listeners have chronic issues, autoimmunity, Lyme disease or co-infections or other viral um, immune dysfunction. And I think more and more in our toxic world, that's part of it, right? There's this overload and then the weakened immune system. So for me, you and I, we understand the mouth is such a reservoir of so many things, but maybe you can go like dentistry 101 and how for the person out there who's like, yeah, I've done everything, but why would my mouth have anything to do with it? Maybe start kind of at the basics of like, why is this so critical to overall health and the cardiovascular system and all the systems in the body? Sure. I, I've thought of this many times of, of trying to try to break it down into the simple things. So this is the most recent Um well, for one, I will say kind of disclaimer is this is the start of the gut. We talk about gut health, huge importance. Uh, it is one. Um, everything that gets down here usually comes through here as well. So I, 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 the relationship there should be very obvious. Cleaning it up, I think the importance there is huge. However, there's probably going to be many people that that. I say that you, you almost couldn't kill them if you tried. They're very resilient. And then there's the people that are not, and they're going to be more sensitive. I think we're seeing more of that on the younger generation. I bought a practice recently. I, I've been an independent contractor, so I've learned a lot of things, but now I'm learning business a little. Um, I have some older patients and in some of them, this may not apply as much, yeah. but if you're looking for, the, the things that could be inflammatory. I, I take the Swiss approach. That's been mostly my training. Uh, so they have a program called uh, Biological Dentistry and Ceramic Implantology. It's out of Kreuzlingen, Switzerland. It's a really wonderful clinic. It's called the Swiss Biohealth Clinic. Um, and, and when I really started to learn this, it's because I took a patient there that had all the, the skin rash and was miserable with chronic fatigue, autoimmune issues, um, mass, mass cell for sure, looking back. Um, and she had all this orthodontics done and she had metal hardware in from orthognathic surgery and, and braces and some metal implants and some root canals. Um, and so in the biological Swiss model, they have, they call them interference fields. Mm -hmm. So, and this is Dr. Klinghart. So Dr. Klinghart and Dr. Vols, they formed this clinic. Uh, Dietrich Klinghart. So he's pretty well known um, in your field. Um, so anyway, the interference fields, basically, if we boil it down very, very, very simple, and I'll quote Dr. Wall, one of my colleagues in Utah, anything metal or dead, yes. get it out of the head. Wow. Those are going to be the main things that are inflammatory in that we can break it down a bit more. But I like to think of interference fields or, or blockages or inflammatory sources, triggers. Yes. Um, and for some people, as you know, simple triggers can be gigantic and or prevent maybe somebody on their health journey from getting better. And, and this can be the silent problem, I think, very often, um, but a big part of it. So what could those metal or dead? Of course, Decay is not good. That's a bacteria profile that you're swallowing. Um, decay is not great. Periodontal disease, of course, this is 
Uh, this is general dentistry 101. Those are the two mechanical things that we looked at coming out of dental school, um, certainly. Um, now you can dive a little bit deeper and say, well, well dead teeth, um, teeth that have died, uh, they're necrotic, they have no more blood flow. And, and so all that, the, you form an abscess sometimes under the tooth, and every time you're biting down, you're going to get bacteria into the bloodstream that certainly circles through your body. Um, very problematic for prosthetic heart valves, et cetera. So the focal theory of infection is important. Um, now, okay, root canals are dead. Mm -hmm. um, I would say maybe, again, there's those, some people that can handle that and the body can wall it down, but many of us cannot. So root canals, very critical. Those are also going to be interference fields. And then you could dive even deeper, so into the bone. So there's pockets of bone, just little fatty pockets that have no blood supply. Very often in previous extraction sites, that's been coined many terms, cavitations to um, osteonecrosis. The new term is FDOJ. We could talk about that. There's quite a bit of research on it. Um, but those are those can harbor toxicities as well, mostly because they're fatty content. Um, metal implants, yes. mercury fillings, of course. And then I would say anything on top of dentistry that could be toxic from fluoride to anesthetic, some things that we have to weigh out and, and have the ability to use. Um, but what we're trying to do, and I think, oh, you had a, a recent podcast that you summarized, you want to get the, the bad stuff out and the good yeah. stuff. Um, and that's that really is generally what biological dentistry has stemmed on is to get the junk out. And, um, and mainly that the newer ways of biological dentistry, and I think it's really important is to get the good stuff in also means you've got to rebuild. Um, I think that in the mouth, the big problems, they can be an energetic problem, a toxic problem, or a functional problem. And all can be debilitating. Yes. Um, I think that, you know, there's the meridian systems, all those teeth. They're basically nerve endings. They come from the ectoderm of the neural crest. So they, 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 they're there for feedback to the brain. And a tooth, you can feel, if a live tooth, you can feel eight microns of a difference. Wow. So, so the feedback, and so the way your morphology of all your teeth, how they come together, ideally the jaw is stable in the socket, all the teeth hit evenly, they all stimulate the meridians evenly. And then the ramps on your front teeth, as, as you move the jaw around, the back teeth come apart so they don't clip into each other. This is called anterior guidance. There's a real way of restoring teeth. And if it's not right, it can be an interference, which can become a neurological issue, a neck issue. Um, and that could be debilitating on its own. So it's not all about toxicology um, or, or interfering meridians. It's also about function. Posture. Uh, you had a recent um, yes. podcast on that too. I mean, we know those things are so important. And for some people, it could be the difference of getting better. Hey, everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science, and Faith, is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you wanna get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. Sure. Love that. Now it's uh, just so many thoughts as you talk. And I always love to share, you'll get a kick out of this, my personal experience, because I went to the Swiss Mountain Clinic, which some of them trained with the doctors that you worked with. So they do some of that biological Swiss dentistry as well. And I remember being there and um, the doctor looked at, so I had two, uh, two uh, root canals on these two second to the last yeah. molars. And those meridians correlated with breast, colon, and pancreas, if I'm right, if I remember right. And I remember yeah. the chart and I was like, 
holy cow, that's my history. I had breast cancer at 25. I had Crohn's at 26 and I have pancreatic insufficiency. Like bingo. Yeah. When I, when I heard that and I was like, I don't have to believe in the meridians. I do. Right. But like, I don't even have to believe in that. That was literally my medical history. It was the next six months. I got them both pulled. I got ceramic implants and literally within seven days at that time, I was struggling with psoriasis. I don't have it anymore. That was just one outward manifestation of the skin with this whole toxic access, right? And this dead necrotic tissue. And like you said, I don't believe that every single person has to have root canals removed, but many people who have immune issues, they can't tolerate that dripping of the bacteria as you described so well. And I was one of those because I was like immune deficiency and post-cancer and all that. All that to say, I had that work done within seven days, my psoriasis cleared up and never came back. So I was a believer from, I mean, I already was, but if I hadn't believed the power of biological dentistry and getting those root canals and seeing the meridians in real life and seeing it's the exact same, same teeth, you know, it's the same meridian. Yeah. I was like, so I now in my practice as a doctor, I don't know what to do with the mouth except send them to people like you. But what I often do is when we're stuck or when there's some complexities or when there is, um, something that's mysterious. I'm like, we're not getting there. I'm like, you have to go see Dr. Pop or someone like you because that's when, and so often you'll send me these amazing reports and you'll find um, necrotic tissue or cavitations or, and I find, especially in the complex chronic people with infections, they can hold, I did some um, biopsies of the root canals and it was full oh, yeah. of everything from protozoa to Lyme spirochetes, to fungus, to uh, you name it, right? You've seen those. Um, yes. Right. I'd say 100% of the time, if we're, if you're going to test a root canal, even if the root canal looks really, really healthy from a, a general dentistry standpoint, again, some people, maybe they're okay with that. And this is the challenge is every time we take out a root canal and we send it for a PCR analysis, it will always have a laundry list of anaerobic nasty bacteria. Yeah. The, not the question of if it's, if it's there. It's the same with cavitation. They're there. Yes. It's really a question of is is it is it holding you back? Yeah. And many times it is. It but it takes very often a little bit of faith, or like you had, you you had a sign. Yeah. Which is fascinating. Meridians do this all the time. Right. They they, they indicate to us, or you can even muscle test. Yes. And and people need that. I tell my patients this all the time. A I need Jill Carnahan to get them prepared to be able to do things. Yeah. They have to be on board with their team and their team has to believe in what we're doing. And I have to believe in what we're doing. When we do that, yeah. it's great. It's it's when we lose faith sometimes, that's when, if, some, if I have a patient on the fence about doing something like removing a root canal, unless it's obviously infected, that's a lot easier to decide. Right. But they they need to know and believe that this is the right thing to do because that's when great outcomes happen. So we're not ever trying to pressure people, but I do find it's a challenge in, in dentistry. And my colleagues, my younger colleagues that are learning biological dentistry, it's it, they're learning about cavitations and they're learning about root canals and they're seeing these wonderful, like you, yes. these miraculous changes, not every time. Yes. So you know that's what, where it's a little like, it's a dance and- yep. um, Yes, and I'm you, on that other side the same way, like trying to, because I know the power. I often tell my story, like I said, publicly, I wanted to make sure and share that because for me, it was so profound. Um, mm -hmm. and, and because my population is those, I always like to talk about the toxic load bucket. And this is a perfect example, because if you have a small capacity, like I did for glutathione detoxification and some of those genetics that make it a little bit harder for me to get rid of toxic chemicals or infections, then all, every single thing that's added that layers into that bucket, all of a sudden the water spilling over the top. So that getting out that old root canal for some of my patients could be the thing that gives them margin back. And then, yeah. and again, it's neat to um, always be able to send them and trust that that you can help because I can't do that. I always feel like the remediators in the mold world and the dentists like you are the two kinds of extensions to what I do that I could not do successfully what I do without you. So yeah. thank you for being that. It's a great term too, is I, I, I term a lot of what I do is I do remediation dentistry. Oh yeah. I, I think it's a, it's a good way of it. And then the other half is the rejuvenation part is to be able to rebuild uh, teeth that you you don't want to just take teeth out that was a very old way uh, I don't say very old this is not that old I'd say Hal Huggins kind of one of the founders but we didn't have great implants we were putting titanium back in yeah. so titanium 
I mean, it's worth saying that more people have uh, titanium uh, allergies. Either it's the titanium dioxide particles um, yeah. or it's also energetic. More EMF waves perhaps affects it. There's many things. Still the most widely used implant and still very successful. But now we're starting to see where it's not. As zirconium um, so, and they're doing yeah, really zirconia, well. <laughs> the zirconium oxide. Um, and a lot of people say, you know, zirconium is a metal. Yes, it is a transition metal. But a zirconium oxide, a metal oxide, is a non-metal. It is a ceramic, um, and, and that's what you have. And those are fully oxidized, so they don't they don't typically have that energy block, and they they also they heal without the inflammatory markers. So we know if you place an, a, a metal implant, for instance, you know your TNF alpha comes off, yes. and, you're losing damage. <laughs> and and you don't see that with the the ceramic implants. And the result is the tissue. Sh- loves it yes. it's pink and it's happy and it grows around it um not not the same with uh the titanium predecessor but uh, side note I guess. Mm-hmm. no this is actually important because people all the time are asking and they want to ask their dentist and there are some dentists that won't even consider um i'd love for you to clarify but from um what i've heard is we've had longer years of experience with titanium and how they actually stay in the bone long term yeah. so some dentists might sway towards that because they have more experience is it harder to put in a tri- uh, zirconium versus titanium is there more things to think about is that part of it or um the type of implants i use i i feel they're very very easy to use and, and actually ceramic um Ceramic was before titanium, ah, okay. um, but the 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 method or the material wasn't as great. It was quite brittle, which really gave it a bad kind okay. of a bad name for but so long. You need long. something that has just a tiny bit of give, right? Like yeah, you're... that's so. So titanium has that. Okay. It has a little bit of flexibility. But now, if you look them look at them right next to each other, just as strong. Um, but different a little bit. So you have to be a little bit more concerned about overheating the bone. I think from a, a dental perspective, it's it's definitely doable. It's just changing the old dogma yeah. and, and realizing, you know, what it, what the, the new is. The There's a, a Marco Godola. He's a, was CEO of Strauman, which is a very large implant company. And they're all moving towards ceramic because they know. Yeah, they know. They know by the way the tissue works with it. And the, if you look at any dental magazine, you'll see periimplantitis is uh-huh. one of the biggest topics. And it's almost all around metal because metal attracts bacteria. Yes. And, and if you look at tissue around metal, if the metal gets exposed, it, you can't clean it well. And then it's an inflammatory problem. Um, so what do I, what would I tell your, your, your patients? I think it's hard for dentists to consider removing metal implants and replacing them with non-metal, although it's not that hard to do. Okay. Um, there are risks with everything you do, as long as, again, everybody's on board, we understand the risks, not a hard thing to do. Um, in some cases, much more challenging if there's not much bone, yes. but that's challenging no matter what. Mm-hmm. And if the implant's already exposed, it's just a slow death, if it's a metal implant. Yeah. Um, I think there's, there's Melisa test. Do you use Melisa test? That's at all? what I was just going to ask you about. Cause I used to use this all the time. I don't know where to go right now, but I used to absolutely test people for yeah. um, implants. Tell people about that. Cause that's yeah. Really- so the Melisa test is, is actually, it's, it's done, I believe in Germany. Okay. Um, and there's a couple other companies in Germany that are great. There well, was you can, one in the U S and maybe that's why I stopped doing there it. There was, there was. Okay. And I recently I, I did, uh, send out for a Melisa test and they said they couldn't do it for the U S at the moment, oh. but they gave another number, which I believe is, is maybe that start that started okay. back up. It's basically a sensitivity test to titanium, a couple of different titanium, uh, dioxides and even zirconia as well. Yeah. Um, so it can give you a sense like my mother, for instance, she had, um, uh, she, Sjogren like yeah. symptoms, very, very, very dry mouth and, and eyes. Um, and, and she used to get migraines really, really bad. She had a metal implant and a lot of mercury fillings. And so a, a good biological dentist should be able to remove those mercury fillings, by the way, safely, really? which looks like a hazmat room and it yes. should. <laughs> right. Um, so we removed all that with my mother and then remove that titanium implant. And, and it was very easy to replace with a non-metal one. And lo and behold, I mean, I don't know if she has much problem with migraines much anymore. Um, and, 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 and a little bit, the Sjogren symptoms did improve. 
this is what we see in biological dentistry. This is what the biological dentists love about what they do is you, you see, wow, these changes. And it's so different than what we were taught. It'd be taboo to remove something like a metal implant, but not if somebody is, is, is ill. And so my mother did that Melisa test and it did come up. She was reactive to titanium. Well, that makes it easy. Yes. You know, then, then that whole belief thing is, yeah, I, I was really is... liking when we had get that was probably 15 years ago. And then lately it hasn't, I'll have to check back to see if we can get it. Cause I really, really, that, that always helped yeah. me with patients too. Like, oh, that, or even what it, it could be a hip implant or a dental implant. And these yes. have cells for both, um, you know, uh, biological hips or legs or knees or whatever, or, um, the yes. teeth, but we'll have to get that. That's really important. I, so, I might have something for you. I ran something not long ago for Dr. Prusimak. Yeah who has resilience code because he does a lot of the orthopedic stuff too. Those are great tests and we should be aware of those. So I'm going to find one for you. I would love that because my patients okay. are always asking. And um, so let's talk about, so someone's coming in and um, I didn't mention, but I also had two cavitations and the wisdom teeth. And what I was just going to continue to, to to say to your points is every time I've had any work done that is pretty significant and more invasive, my health has gone to a new level. And I want to be here like promoting what you do out there as your biggest advocate, because I know personally, I would not be where I am. People all the time are like, oh, have you recovered from mold illness? And I actually had Lyme disease and mold illness and all of these things, Crohn's and a cancer. I'm yeah. free of all those things. And part of it, I would say 30% might be of the dental work that I've had done because every time I took a new level, because my immune system is one of those that does not deal well with little infections. Um, and in my mind, you mentioned your mother with Sjogren's, me with psoriasis, these kinds of autoimmune processes, we can look at the gut or the mouth similar way. We know the gut immune interface where those cells, where those crossover, these bacteria, antigens like LPS into the bloodstream, that is the start that is ground zero for autoimmunity. It makes perfect sense that the teeth would be the same because there's no liver there. There's no barrier. It goes straight to the bloodstream, right? With no protective so I just, I want to emphasize that for people listening, that this is a really big deal. If you have autoimmunity, you have chronic inflammation and you've done all the other right things, you really should see a biological dentist because this is such a core piece of that toxic load or infectious burden, really. Um, so let's talk about cavitations because if someone's, you know, maybe curious, I know they can do, tell us if someone comes in and says, okay, I want to get a check. I want you to check me over, see if there's anything going on. What kind of exam, what kinds of things are you going to look for? Would you do a cone CT? Give us kind of the little protocol of what someone yeah. would see when they'd see you. What someone would... Yeah. Cavitation, the, the, the silent infection. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say to start with that is uh, Johan Lechner is uh, he's a dentist and a professor um, I think at the university in, in Munich and does do research on cavitations. So cavitations been around a long time. You can have them, you know, in your long bones and your hips. Let's just call it a, a fatty pocket, mm -hmm. a, a dead fat, fatty pocket. There's no blood supply. Um, they, they, they did get changed to Nico, which was a name of neuralgia inducing cavitational osteonecrosis. And then now the new term is FDOJ fatty degenerative osteolysis of the jawbone doesn't matter. We can call it a fatty pocket. Um, and they form usually in low blood flow areas. Mm -hmm. So super common third molars. Um, and there's been many theories of you know, why do they, you know, somebody left the ligament when you took a third molar out. Well, most surgeons would know the ligament comes out with it for third molars if they're impacted. Um, I think it has a lot more to do, and I'm, this is maybe my Swiss background. It has a lot to do with uh, the lack of nutrients when we're very often removing wisdom teeth because we're in our, maybe our twenties, we're probably not eating very well. We're growing. So we're nutrient deficient. Do we rest? Probably not. Yeah. So really the healing, if it's not or something, yeah. right? Like it says. Exactly. <laughs> so that's, that'd be more of what I would put for, for a reason, the etiology of, of why they form, of course, low blood flow area. So if it's a low blood flow area and it doesn't have a good blood supply, it can become a bit more fatty. And that's when, I get concerned for our toxic patients because fat is a great place for glyphosate, heavy metals, mold, you know, aflatoxin, uh, lime, um, and which have and tons of bacteria. It all has been found in those sites. And Dr. Lechner, again, has, has had some good published research on that. Okay. How do you diagnose? Um, tough because as a surgeon, my diagnosis comes and I think this is a little bit of just we live in America we do have a dental board we have to stand you know up to what we we, we do 
I would diagnose a cavitation based on a biopsy. Mm -hmm. um, the unfortunate thing is they are almost always a, a, an osteonecrosis, a cavitation. And so when I, when I do cavitation surgery, we usually almost always do a biopsy. And I tell my patients, I'm going to do a biopsy this, and I'm almost certain it's always going to be a cavitation. So it's not for me a question of if patients have them. They do. Yes. Probably over 95% of the time. Wow. The question is truly, is it a problem for them? Are they toxic? Yes. That's a harder question to answer. I can look at an x-ray and just see low density areas back here and suspect that it's going to be a fatty pocket. Um, and most of the time, like I said, it is. Um, but the diagnosis of it, that's a microscopic analysis if it's a dead bone pocket. The hard part, again, is, is it toxic? And that's where I think um, it, it really takes a, an integrative approach. It takes, I need the Joe Carnahan's to, to, you know, this something's not, something's holding this patient back. Do you proactively just go ahead and treat all four? Well, that's what the Swiss do with yeah. every single patient. It's a very safe procedure if it's done. That's correctly. what I noticed when I was there. Every person on my, you know, everybody when, gets it. Everybody yeah. got it, right? They get parasite mm -hmm. treatment and they get dental work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, I, and I wish I could do that for every patient too, but you know, there is time and money limitations for patients and it may not always be needed. It's great if you could do it. I usually use those sites to harvest bone from, because again, I'm, I'm biological. If I have to do a bone graft, I love it if I can take the patient's bone. And we always use their blood and we always use ozone and we always use lasers. And, and, but these cavitation areas, the outer bone is healthy. So when you maybe cut a window in, into the cavitation, you can take the window and you can certainly clean it and you can, you can grind that up and use it as the patient's bone. Fantastic. Um, so basically opening it up and scraping out that pocket. So it's clear. How do you actually, and do you put ozone before you close it up then to make sure it's sterile or? Yeah. So our process would be, we would, we would make an incision. You just pull the tissue back and you, you make a little window in the, for the lowers, for instance, you make a little window in the bone uh, that you can, you can peel back and you use a, an ultrasonic device. You go in and you clean out. Usually what you see is not blood. It's very often just fat yellow. It's just fat and or oily, oily blood. And so you go in and you use instruments. And of course you're looking at a, you really need a three-dimensional x-ray. That would probably be the most common way to, I, I would say, quote unquote, diagnose a cavitation. Again, I don't call that a diagnosis. The biopsy is a diagnosis, but you suspect they're there and you know right where the nerve is and you know where the sinus is. You need to know those structures because then when you go to clean it out, well, you're not going to get into an area that you're going to have a, a, a risk of nerve impairment or sinus perforation. And I'd say most of the time cavitations you know, they take about 20, 30 minutes a piece, um, but you could spend a lot of time disinfecting it. So once you clean it all out and you ultrasonic it out, you take a, you, you can take a laser and it, it's like a dishwasher and it yeah. bubbles all around and, and then you could clean it out a little more and you're looking for good blood flow. So once the oily stuff stops and then you can take your ozone gas and you put it in there for a minute at 20 gamma and, and you can, then you clean it out a little bit more and you kind of look at, and then you take all of their blood platelets that you've spun down yeah. and you've made little membranes and you pack those in there and you can always, you can put an antibiotic on it. That's, that's a Swiss con, con a technique. I think that does help as well. Metronidazole usually. Mm -hmm. um, and we always run an IV of vitamin C and we usually very often, depending on the patients, I'll often run an IV of an antibiotic as well. Cause you're stirring stuff up. Um, but I don't think it's necessary. The, the vitamin C, the sodium ascorbate, uh, 25 grams, absolutely, all day long. And these patients, they do great. Yeah. You clean that up. All you got to do is close that back up with all their platelets in there. And usually the tissue closes right back up together, suture it all up, and, and it's no problem. Um, you do sometimes get postoperative swelling. It's usually not at all like your wisdom teeth, though. Yeah. So, I can vote uh, for so that. I, love doing I had that. both yeah. wisdom teeth, which I looked like a huge chipmunk, and and yeah. then I had the cavitation on the bottom, and it was very compared to all this other stuff I've had done. It was quite easy and painless, and just exactly the procedure you mentioned. I love that you went through that for people because a lot of my patients that may be a starting point because I feel like it, if they're not sure about the root canal, that I don't know what would you say if they have say they have two root canals. So first of all, say it's a chronically ill patient with lots of autoimmune inflammation, the kinds of people. Glad you said that. Good. 
And then, so we yep. have this chronically ill, not a, not a healthy 17 year old, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then, yeah. um, then on top of that, where I've done all my work and I'm like, huh, Dr. Pop, I think there might be something here. Can you take a look and say they have um, evidence of at least the bottom cavitations and they have uh, two root canals. Where would you start? What would you suggest? Would you do it all at once? Any suggestions on how you'd approach yeah. that? Awesome questions. Uh, for one, they usually present with like a panoramic, a flatter yeah. image. The three-dimensional one is, is fantastic too. And, and so first I would label, okay, what, very basic, I step back, what could be inflammatory? Anything metal or dead? So first you look and say, well, okay, are you seeing Jill Carnahan? Are you seeing your naturopath, your integrative doctor? Because that, if you said is a chronic patient now, because I'm learning from you, you know, what about their limbic system and their yes. vagal? You know, that <laughs> might need to be dealt with first because I have patients that that they, they don't always respond well, but even if you turn the light on. Yeah. Um, and so those are the patients. OK, we got to make sure they got coverage. Yes. They yes. got they've got the medical part. I ask the questions. I spend a lot of time doing it, but but I need help. And so I make sure that the referral network of we'll get you at least checked out. What's your vitamin D level? Because uh-huh. I don't want right. to get into bone unless it's above 70. I just don't want to do it because the the research shows an implant has a 300% greater risk of failure if you have low vitamin D. So, so the, so again, biological dentistry, it's not rushed. So step back, plan it. Now there's always emergencies. I get it. Mm -hmm. So patients said, okay, I thought, you know, totally might have a root canal cavitations for one, just get a very comprehensive exam. And then you start to say, okay, make sure you get your vitamin D checked and work with the practitioner to get your regenerative capacity up. Mm-hmm. We can start right away by removing metal Perfect. and to take away any decay, get your gums healthy. Again, get that regenerative capacity up before we take any, any, any knife and yeah. do any surgery. And, and then I would say for sure, any root canals, if you want to follow the, the principles and you're chronically ill, it, it's say if you have inflammatory disease, cancer, anything, anything at all serious that you're, you're, you're definitely committed to clean up. I'd say do it all and do it all at once. Yeah. One healing, because otherwise there's so much time it takes to heal and it's not that big a deal to be sedated Uh and to go and just remove the root canals. And then first, you know, metals out everything there. I would remove the root canals first, and then I would do the cavitations and then I would place the non-metal implants. Usually the same day. And that's for the purpose of, of grafting and trying to, Oh, you um, use the bone you just took from the cavitation. <laughs> right. You use the cavitation bone. Absolutely. And then you're also trying to preserve as much bone and tissue as possible. If the implant can be placed, it gives support. And again, zirconia and tissue, they do well together. So it's a great way to preserve the ridge. Sometimes we can't always place the implant. So we graft and we hopefully graft with their bone and their blood um, you can use donor, um, and some people don't want to, um, but, but we try to do whatever is going to at least give the best outcome. If they can get through that yeah. and you do, they heal wonderfully. And I've taken patients, uh, to Switzerland where we did two day surgeries Wow! and unbelievably, you know, with the vitamin C IV drips every day, yeah. they do great. And sometimes these like you had, and I've seen many patients just cavitations or one root canal even yeah. They're, 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 they're definitely a step further in their health journey. And that's, that's, that's heaven for us. It is. And it's just, it's like I said, once again, I can't do what I do without you because I know there's so often, I would say, I mean, I, I honestly, probably hundred percent of them need assessment as far as the chronically complex. And then 80% of them need some sort of, it might be simple, but it also could be. And I really like that you're doing it all together. I had mine in bits and pieces and I did okay, but I, it would have been almost better just to have the whole shebang done. I had three root canals and two cavitations and uh, two implants. So it, it yeah. would have been, it took over uh, 18 months at least to get it all done. Um, and for you, yeah. that's, you don't have that time. Right. <laughs> sure. exactly. So we tell people that a lot too, is because you, you, again, it's planned. If you had a surgery, I want you to take at least four days off for a smaller surgery, just ground yourself, you know, first regenerative yeah. capacity up plan. Oh yeah. And I'm back to work the next day too. So <laughs> yeah. Like, and you got stuff. Right. And if, if you did three of those surgeries, yeah. you know, then you're into what, you know, uh, right. six weeks and oh, that's, yeah. that's yeah. tough for people. Yeah. I love hearing that. 
Um, this is so awesome and informational, and I'm just so grateful that you're out there doing that. Um, what do you see in our last few minutes here? What do you see coming up? So much is changing in medicine and dentistry. Any exciting new? First of all, I just want to acknowledge that all the stuff you do alongside the ozone, the PRP, the vitamin C, I feel like that is crucial to your success and so important because it really gives, it's like me giving, if I give um, peptides to help with a healing surgery or dental, or I'll like be on my end, but I love that you're doing that. But what else? Is there anything on the horizon that you've been hearing about or thinking about incorporating mm-hmm. that you think is the next thing in biological dentistry? Yeah. Um, I, the, the stuff I've been interested in lately, I, I really, we, we draw so much blood. We do so much PRF um, in, the, in the growth factors that you can do. So we do a lot of injections. Uh-huh. Um, we've done a lot more uh, uh, regenerative, like facial aesthetics that is all like biofillers. You can take your blood, you can heat it, you can make it a gel and put, you know, more growth factors into it from your blood, only your blood. And you can inject it and do fillers um, and then micro needles. So I know the vampire facial, but it's, it's definitely going to another level. And I think that the, with lasers combined with it, people love it and we love it. So I think it's a savior for, for, I, I believe in the future, like the hygienists, <laughs> they're uh-huh. going to want to do more facial aesthetics. So you do your hygiene care and your skin care together. And um, so exosomes would be yeah. the, one of the next thing I think, I think we're going to see more of. Yeah. Um, and it's exciting. Uh, the regenerative part, 100%. Bone grafting and bone building is challenging. And so there's some new ways and some new regenerative materials from the from the patient themselves. That's exciting to me, for sure. Oh, I couldn't agree more. We'll have to have a whole nother conversation on that because on, on the ski slopes, how about that? <laughs> I'd love that. Let's do it. Oh, okay, you got it. <laughs> well, Dr. Pop, thank you for your expertise. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. I know the patients appreciate it. And just thank you for being here in our community and serving um, with what you do. It's a pleasure and an honor to partner with you. Thank you. I. I love the relationship and I'm so glad to to be working with you more. So thank you for having me. You're welcome.